Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm so glad to know who King Jesus is. Amen. Amen. And to know that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And one day he is coming back. I want to be ready when he comes back. Anybody else in the house want to be ready when Jesus comes back? Amen. To be prepared for when the Lord comes. Amen. Good to have everyone in the house of the Lord. Good to see Derek in the house of the Lord. Good to have him back home with us tonight. Amen. Amen. Of course, I believe uh, Bonnie and Scott probably looked right past him when he got there and were looking for Clara. Uh, when you have grandkids, it doesn't seem like we seem like the kids. We all sort of lose our place. Amen. And uh, those grandkids take over. So, so good to have them back home. Good to have everyone here. Let's pray for those who are traveling, who are going on vacation. Lord would be with them, protect them, bring them home safely. Amen. I want all of our brothers and sisters to come home safely. Well, let's, as we go to the word of the Lord tonight, let's just open up our hearts. Let's ask the Lord to have his way in this service. Would you join me in prayer tonight? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your word tonight. Lord, it is a lamp to our feet. It's to be a light to our path, to order our steps. God, as we go into your word tonight, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. Let us not only be hearers, but let us have the courage to go to beyond, to be doers of your word. Lord, we praise you and thank you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. amen. And God bless you. You may be seated this evening. Sometime back when um, we were on vacation, we were in a, staying in a condo that was overlooking the Gulf, pretty high up, it was about 20 floors in the air, and it allowed you to have a view and to see far beyond what you could see when you were down at the surface level. In fact, uh, we were able to see hundreds of stingrays just throughout the days going through the, the water, a couple of sharks at times, small sharks coming through, but you were able to just to see through where in the water you couldn't, you didn't have that vantage point, you didn't have that perspective, and so we had a great time. Of course, the last day of our time there, um, the news reported that there had been a shark that got a little too close to a swimmer, to my wife's angst. And uh, on the clip that they were showing, they showed how someone was just enjoying their time in the water, and sort of the shark just sort of came by, and then turned around and started to come back by again. And they were oblivious to what was going on. They couldn't see it because the, the shark was sort of hidden under the surface. And it was those who had a, the perspective that were able to, to shout out, to scream out. And uh, it led to a swimmer who had been oblivious deciding to swim for shore because of the warning signs that had come and, uh, and, and made it safely. And I, I was thinking today as uh, what I want to talk to you about tonight, the scripture reveals that throughout our, our life that we are going to face opposition. The Bible uses a phrase like this, that the devil is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, trying to catch his prey. The Bible makes us aware of dangers and, and, and it's critical that we uh, are aware of what is out there, but yet the greatest adversary uh, that we have to worry about is not the devil as much as it is our flesh, our flesh. Uh, it's critical that we have an ear that is attuned to the word of God and a heart that is sensitive to the spirit because it knows uh, to shout out for danger. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about that tonight uh, from the book of Judges. And Joshua, the first chapter, beginning with verse number one, Bible says that, and the death of Moses, the servant of God, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan and you and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. As I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites into the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. 
As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. You may observe to do according to all the law which my, Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn it to the right, from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. So this is a time of transition, a leadership transition. Succession has taken place, and, and uh, Moses is passed from the scene, and Joshua is his successor. And the Lord shows up to speak to him and is telling him, now is the time to go in and to possess the promised land that we have been looking forward to for decades now. And uh, it's very interesting what he begins to tell them. He says, no man can stand before you all the days of your life. You do not have to worry about the opposition. That's what he's saying. Don't have to worry about who's against you, who will come against you. Don't, don't worry about that. I, why? Because I'll be with you. And if God is with you, what do you have to worry about? If God's with you. So he said, don't worry about the opposition. I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. And, and then this is my title tonight. Be strong and courageous or be strong and of good courage. He, he, he repeats that in the ne next verse. Only be strong and very courageous. Do not turn to the right hand or to the left hand. Walk in the way that I've instructed you to go. Don't worry about what might get in front of you. Don't, don't be tempted to turn to the right or left because someone is in your path. I'm with you. And no matter what is going to be in your path, we can take care of that. Be strong and courageous no matter what you face because we're going to make it. Just don't turn to the right hand or to the left hand. This is the word of the Lord to Joshua about the children of Israel. He was calling for them to have faith and to have faith in, in his word and in his promises that they are about to experience the fulfillment of things that have been promised for them for generations. Uh, they, they're going to pass through the Jordan during flood stage, and God is going to show him that he's with Joshua just like he was with Moses, that they are fulfilling the call just like they did when, when the Red Sea parted. Now it's going to be the Jordan River during flood stage. He, he lets them know the land is yours wherever you wherever you tread, the soles of your feet touch, that is your land. No one will stand before you. He says, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. This is what God has promised to do. Israel's part of the campaign is simply this. Be strong and courageous. Cour courage means the ability uh, to do something even when you are frightened. To, the ability to not be deterred by danger or, or pain to be brave. It means to keep on going no matter what you feel. Be strong and courageous. Do not turn. This is their only part. They don't have to worry about how they're going to take the land. They don't have to worry about walled cities. They don't have to worry about giants. They don't have to worry about swords and spears. All they have to do is make sure that no matter what they feel because of what's in their way, that they don't stop. That no matter what, what emotion, what fears might try to, to captivate them and hold them back, that they keep on marching, that they don't try to go a different route because God will be with them. You know, tonight we need a greater, greater revelation of our relationship with God. There are always pressures when it comes to living for God. There are always obstacles. And too many fall out by the way, as was the warning to Joseph's brothers, is that they have a journey and we are on the journey, but something frightens us or something we think of, maybe an obstacle that is insurmountable. And so we think, you know what, I, I'm going to have to take a detour only to get lost in the detour. You will always get lost when you take a detour from God's plan. There, there are no shortcuts. There are no roundabouts. God has a plan and a purpose, and we are to walk in it. In fact, Timothy says it like this. Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a, a sound mind. Notice he, he's letting us know that God didn't give us a spirit of fear or timidity, that, that anything of that nature is not from God. 
Anything that would cause us to shrink back from what God calls us to do, it's not from God. You don't have to pray about it. You don't have to sense it. That, that anything that would cause us to hold back is not from God. In fact, Acts 1 and 8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. When we talk about the Holy Ghost in the scripture of the Holy Spirit, it's always associated with power, not timidity, not fear. It's understanding that it is God in us. So what shall we fear? The Holy Spirit doesn't enslave us to the bonds of fear again like we were once shackled. Romans 8.15 says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. This is what is letting us know that we are adopted. We are joined together with Jesus Christ. In fact, when we go back to 2 Timothy 1.7, uh, that we read a few verses ago, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Scholars refer to this as a verbal echo. Turn to somebody and say, that's a verbal echo. It's the same tone. It's the same narrative setting. And what it does is it, because of the similarity, it calls to mind the congregation when they hear it to go back to Joshua's day, to be strong and of good courage. And that's what he's saying. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Why? Because we're children of God. We're heirs. We're joint heirs with Christ. And so he has given us power. He has given us love and a sound mind. And, and that's not meaning that you're mentally stable. Uh, the sound mind here, it's talking about self-control, self-discipline, that you are able to walk and to be in control because of the power of God that is in you. So you can walk righteously and holy and godly because God is in us, because God is with us, because we have power through the Holy Ghost. So we don't have to be timid or afraid. We can walk with, with boldness. In fact, if you look at the early church, the apostolic church was called to be bold. In fact, this was highlighted at our camp meeting on Friday. Brother Cunningham finished by talking about being audaciously apostolic, being bold. And Brother Anthony Cox spoke during the day on, on boldness. When you go to the scriptures, there's something about this that is observed. In the New Testament church, Acts 4.13 says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. They perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Peter and John speak with boldness. And those who are listening are to them are saying, where, where does this boldness come through? It's, it's not because of the knowledge they have or the education they have. It's not because of the training they have. They perceive it's because they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They have been trained. They have sat at the feet of Jesus Christ. There is boldness when you have the word of God there is a boldness that should come into your life that it doesn't matter what the knowledge of this world says let God be true our confidence is not in the knowledge of this world our confidence is in the word of God Amen. and they were bold in it they're bold in it and that's why Depends on our relationship with Jesus. That's why there is no substitute for prayer, for fasting, for the word of God in our lives. Acts 4.14, the next verse says, And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. The third part of this was the demonstration that had taken place. And when you look here, it's, it's, it, it's real difficult to, to argue against the impossible or the supernatural when it's standing right there in front of you. And this is what should give us confidence to be bold in our witness and bold in living for God. Because when you look around, you don't have to look far to realize that you are surrounded by miracles where God has delivered and saved and restored. There's no telling what would happen to the people in this place if it had not been for Jesus Christ. If it had not been for the Lord, some of you would not be alive right now. If it had not been before the Lord, there would be some of you that would be developed, divorced right now. If it had not been for the Lord there's no telling what would have happened in your life but when people come together in the power of the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God we can overcome every obstacle we can overcome every obstacle so the Sanhedrin commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus why they understand the source of this boldness it's not boldness in themselves that's why they're saying uh, uh, uneducated untrained. they understand it's not boldness in their ability it's not boldness in their not it's in boldness in what they have received from Jesus 
So they're saying, let's stop talking about Jesus. Acts 4.29, now look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Verse 31, two verses later, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. The early church was not asking to be transported to a better environment, to an easier field to, to work the harvest. They said, no, God, we trust that we're right where we're supposed to be. What, what are they saying? We don't need you to take us to the right hands or the left hand. God, we're going to keep walking the path that you have for us. Just give us boldness to keep going. Faith and confidence and trust in the Lord. And so Israel, they would cross the Jordan. They would establish the 12 memorial stones, those that were in the riverbed and those who were on the side. They would circumcise a new generation, making sure they were renewing the covenant with the next generation. They would conquer Jericho. They would realize the vision uh, that they had been pursuing for more than 40 years. Uh, Rahab would be delivered out of that. And, and Joshua would have this uh, fascinating conversation with the commander of the Lord's army. And God would keep his word. Just what he said. Keep walking. Walk with boldness. Be bold. Be strong. Be courageous. Don't turn to the right or the left. Keep on going in the path that I've called you to. But tragically, at Jericho, some difficult things took place. Joshua 7 and 1 says, The children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. At, at Jericho, this man of the tribe of Judah would covet and would take a Babylonian garment and he would take shekels of silver and a wedge of gold. And the command had been given that the city was to be completely destroyed and consecrated to the Lord. This was the first fruits of what God was going to do throughout the promised land. Joshua 6 verse 18 is when the command is given. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed. When you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. And they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Achan took of the accursed things. And of the holy things. Because once something is consecrated and given to the Lord, it becomes God's. The holy things, the silver, the gold that have been dedicated to the treasury of the Lord. And the curse that Achan brought upon him, he also brought it upon his family and the entire community. That when we're done in Israel, 36 are, are struck down at Hai. And the heart of the people, the Bible says, the heart of the people melted like water. Talk about fear, timidity. Exactly what God did not want for them happened because somebody took of the accursed things. They rebelled against God. Remember the command of Joshua, be strong, be courageous. I'm with you. Nothing to fear about. Just stay on the path. Don't go to the left or don't go to the right. Everything's going to be all right. And yet somebody sways. And listen, one person swaying not only affected him and his family, but it affected the entire community where they lost their faith in God because they took a right turn. What's fascinating is about the scriptures I'm talking to you about today, tonight is if you were in the Sunday morning service, you'll realize that Brother Wilhelm preached from these same verses, same, same passages. And it about... A little bit into his message, I thought, oh, I mean, I might need to change something tonight. And then as soon as I thought it, I felt the Lord say, this is no accident. The two different people, we have not talked about what we were going to talk. We've been thinking about a lot of other things this week with camps that we never even mentioned what we were going to be preaching about today. I felt the Lord say, no, this is exactly the reason why. So on the same scriptures, there's going to be a little different perspective. I can't help but believe that God is trying to focus us tonight that someone really needs to hear 
I need to stay on the path, be strong and courageous. And no matter where the pressure comes, whether it comes from the world, whether it comes from my own family, friends, but wherever the pressure comes, I cannot go to the right or the left because to do so, I might think I'm bettering myself and then really I'm bringing about my destruction. 36 men die. <clears throat> the heart of the people become like water. They're fearful. They're timid. Why? Because this man from Judah rebels. Of course, Judah is the tribe that means praise. Listen to me very carefully. Praise cannot overcome the curse of trespassing against God's law. Praise cannot overcome the curses that are brought by by trespassing God's law. We can't live in rebellion and then just go to the house of the Lord and feel like somehow when we come to praise and to worship God on a Sunday that it will somehow cover us from our rebellion. Hebrews 13 and 15, I understand in this new covenant, we are to offer the sacrifices of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips to give thanks to his name, to, to praise him, to worship him. And it's a wonderful thing when we come and praise and worship and we begin to clap our hands and raise our voice and lift our hands and, and to worship and praise him. And, and, and doesn't it feel good to praise the Lord? Amen. It feels good to praise God. Not only are we giving praise and thanksgiving to him, there, there is this reciprocal thing that we are in the presence of the Lord when people begin to praise and worship him and it always feels good and peaceful to be in the presence of the Lord this is why Saul even though Saul was a reprobate he felt better when he was around people that were praising God but here's what Samuel said first Samuel 15 has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to living for God, we can talk about a sacrifice of praise. But if you think God wants your praise more than he wants your submission and your obedience to his word, you've got another thing coming. We can't live in rebellion and stubbornness and iniquity and then be okay to just come and put our hands together or, or say the right words in a church because we might fool ourselves. But there is a God in heaven that says, you're bringing things upon your life your family, and even hindering the entire community from getting to where they need to go. This is, this is Achan. He takes the Babylonian garment. He takes the silver, the wedge of gold. Why? What had happened here at Jericho? Is here's what the Lord said. Everything here belongs to me. This is first fruits. First fruits. Everything here belongs to me. This, this, in fact, is a picture of what happens when we allow anything to become before God or take the place where God has said, this is mine. First fruits. If you look at scholars all, all over the place, talk to you about the first fruits. This is, this is an example of what happens when we don't pay our tithing, when we don't give him the first fruits. When we say, oh, well, we're coming in, but, but we're going to keep that for ourselves. We're, we're going to sort of hide it, not let anybody know. We can praise him, we can clap our hands, we can do our dance, but, but no one will see that we've held back the tithes or, or other parts, our time, our talent, our treasure, anything that God is supposed to have first. They won't see that we don't give him prayer, that we don't give him that, that time. They, they won't see those things. I, I will keep it hidden. I'll keep it undercover. This is what's happening here with the first fruits. And here's what the Lord says. This is rebellion. This is iniquity. You have rejected the word of the Lord. Just, we're just being real honest to, tonight. There, there's a reason God is speaking to us tonight is to let us understand our first call is to obey the word of God. That's what true worship is. True worship is when we humble ourselves and say, you're God and I'm not. So whatever you say goes, I will submit to your word. And to your ways. 
The curses of disobedience are, this is not something to pray about. You never have to pray about first fruits. You never have to pray about tithing. You never have to pray about putting God first. It is his word. Look at what happened with Joshua 7 and 6. Joshua tore his clothes. He fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord in the evening. He and the elders of Israel, they put dust on their heads. If you'll skip down to verse 10. So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. Here's what the Lord is saying. Stop rolling around in the dirt. Stop begging, tearing your clothes. Now, that might have been effective in a different circumstance, but we know what the issue is. The issue is here is rebellion, sin, iniquity, disobeying the word of God. For they have even taken some of the accursed things, and they have both stolen and deceived. They have also put it among their own stuff. What? Their own stuff. That's not your stuff. That's God's stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before the enemies because they had become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed things from among you. The Lord is saying, you're going out there and you're trying to fight. You're trying to live right. You're trying to do all of those things, but you don't have power. You don't have power because you're rebelling in the things you know to do. And it's quiet in the house of the Lord tonight. But when we do not know what we're supposed to do, what we're supposed to do, what God has made evident and plain, even when we're filled with the Holy Ghost, the Lord steps back. Says, you, you started going a different route. You're, you start thinking you can bypass some things that I'm instructing you to go through. Now, if you'll walk in it, I'll be with you. But if you start going to the right or the left, you're on your own. Submission is required. Not, he said, get up. I, I don't need you to do those things. Submission is required. Here's what King said. Because your heart was tender, 2 Kings twenty two nineteen, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its habits, that you would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and went before me. I also have heard you. Now, notice the difference here. Here, they are humbling themselves before God, and they're saying, God, we have sinned. We will do whatever you want. And God says, now, I listen to that. Humbling ourselves. Achan may be of the tribe of Judah of praise, and, 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 but yet, and he might be indistinguishable from the common man as he was when he hid the things on the earth in the middle of his tent. But God did not receive any glory from him. Joshua would say, come give glory to God. Why? Because no matter what you do, God doesn't get glory out of it if you are not in submission. If you're in rebellion, God doesn't give glory out of it. This is critical for us to understand. It's not just about tithings. It's, it's about rebellion. It's about going our own way. Young people, this is why it's so important to be in harmony in your relationship with your parents in submission. Because if in your rebellion to mom and dad, if they're asking you to do the right things, there is no power in your praise. We're just going through making sounds. But, but it's when there is rebellion. And, and that goes for us as adults as well. It, it's not just young people that are called to be in submission and to obey those who have rule and authority over them. When it comes to the church and it comes to the teachings of the church and, and the direction of the church, we're all to be in obedience to that and to the spirit to, from the, from the under shepherd, which is the pastor, to the chief shepherd, that there is something, there is power in unity and unity in submission. It's critical that we do not underestimate the effects of rebellion on ourselves, on our families, and on our community. Hidden things may initially be indiscernible, but they'll remove the blessings and the favor of God, and it will become evident during tough times. So maybe they didn't notice at first that some things had been hidden, but it became evident when they went into a battle. And sometimes we're coasting along and we're thinking, hey, well, everything's okay. I've got in a way with it. Nobody knows that, that I'm not in submission. Nobody knows that I'm rebelling. Nobody knows that I'm saying one thing and doing another. Nobody knows that I'm not paying my tithes. Or nobody knows that I'm, I'm making a commitment and a covenant or something else and still not doing, doing my own thing. Nobody seems to know. But there will be a time of battle in your life where it will be evident because there will no, be no power to overcome the enemy. What happens is covetous in our life. They, he coveted these things. 
things that people can't see initially. People initially can't see bitterness. But then it starts coming out of our mouth. Starts infecting people around us. People initially can't see offense. The damage it does, but it starts coming out through the works of the flesh. People initially can't see envy or jealousy or wrath. But these things that are in our heart, the, the Bible talks about a root of bitterness, that out of them all kind of fruits start to, to spring forth. You see one here, and you think, well, we'll just pluck that out. And I've dealt with that, and, and, and yet another piece comes out right afterward because there is things that are hidden in the heart. It may or may not be about morality or immorality of a particular choice. Because once Israel addressed the sin, the rebellion, the witchcraft, once they submitted to God, notice what happened in Joshua 8, verse 26. Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the spear until he had utterly destroyed all of the inhabitants of Ai. Now notice this. Only the livestock and the spoil of that city Israel took as a booty for themselves, according to the word of the Lord, which he had commanded Joshua. That the very next city, you know what happens? Is when they have overcome the city, the Lord says, hey, take this for yourselves. Why? Because God had received the first fruit. Take this for yourself. This, this is yours. This is not the first fruit. This is not Jericho. And, and Achan... He loses his life and his family. There are others, a part of the community that are destroyed because he would not trust God. I have to have it more myself. I can't believe that God will take care and supply all my needs. And there's a God in heaven that says, bring me the first fruit. I'll be with you all the way. And then when they get to the next city, all of those around him are being blessed. Why? Because there's a God that says, hey, this is all for you. Now, this would probably be hard for some people to understand. How come, how come what was wrong in Jericho is okay at Ai? You see, we have this problem. We, we, we want everything to make logical sense to us. And well, How come this is okay, but this is not? How come it was okay at, at Jericho, but not at Ai? Because God said, I want everything here. Trust me. Our walk with God is about trusting God. It's not about understanding everything that God does. I'm thankful for the word of God that explains so many things and teaches us. But if you think you're going to understand everything that God asks for us in the minute detail, and sometimes we dig so deep, and yet it's, it's very evident on the surface, is that there are some things that God says, I, I just want you to be different. <laughs> they had permission to have the spoils of the city at the next city. It was waiting for you, Achan. But because you didn't stay on the path, you didn't remain strong and courageous, you detoured because of the flesh, things that you started hiding. It kept you from what God originally had for you. There's a great number of clothes and money and material items. that They're not evil and of themselves. It's just that first fruit belongs to God. But there's a, a city coming down where God's going to bless you abundantly if you will just trust God. See, the, the issue is not the, the clothing necessarily or the silver or the gold. In fact, the silver or the gold, God made them holy. He took them into the temple, to the treasury. It's not that they were bad. It's just God said, they're mine. This is yours. Everything that the Lord asks of us is not about the, the issue or the object necessarily being right or wrong. A lot of it has to do about worship and about witness. Worship and witness. When we talk about apostolic distinctions and distinctives of lifestyle, modesty is not just about sensuality. I, I hear so many times in our day and time, people think that the only purpose of modesty is sensuality. And so there are some things that don't seem sensual to them. So they say, well, I, I don't see an issue with this. And, and they brought a false argument from the word of God. God never says that modesty is just about sensuality. God said, this is what I want for my people. 
It's about distinction and separation. And the Lord said, I want you to be different where people will ask you why you are different and you will begin to tell them about the God you serve. So there's something that has nothing to do with sensuality. It has nothing to do with some of the other. It has God saying, I want people to notice you're different than everyone else in the world and ask you about it. And you need to have an answer to give. I'm sure there are those, why is silver and gold off limits in Jericho? But now it's okay. There are ordinances that are not about logic. There are some, it's not about logic. It's about God testing us. Genesis 22, 5. Abraham said to the young man, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. We will come back to you. And so Abraham, this is the first record of worship, translated worship in the Bible. And he's saying, he's going to go worship. Notice verse 12, 22, 12, farther down. Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. There's a thing that happens in, in Abraham's life where he's to offer up Isaac. Doesn't make a lick of sense to us. It would have been their world because sacrifice, child sacrifice was a very common thing in, in heathen world. And, and so many believe that the Lord was testing Abraham to see if, if he would, would serve Jehovah the way the world served their gods. But, but God is not in the human sacrifice. And the Lord stopped him and says, now I know this was a test. You realize there are some things in our life that the Lord just tests us to find out, do you really love him more than these things? Yes. So it's not even about the rightness or wrongness of something. Sometimes it's about who do you love most? The question of worship, the question of the great command is what will you withhold from God and what will you submit to? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And so will you rebel against that? He says it's witchcraft. It's idolatry. You have idols in your life because you will not do what God says. Iniquity, idolatry. If Achan would have obeyed the Lord and not allowed the covetousness to lead him to taking matters into his own hands, he would have been able to prosper through future victories, he would have always had the confidence of knowing that God was with him. Ladies and gentlemen, taking matters in our own hands always ends up in havoc. Well, I don't understand why the, the Lord says this. Well, pray about it, study it. Maybe, maybe it'll become clearer to you. But if not, here's a good secret. Just do it. Because God knows more than we know. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Let, let's just trust. You know what? There's a reason we're not God. That he's God. And just because we don't understand it, if we had to understand to be able to exist, I mean... We wouldn't be near the people we're sitting next to right now if we had to understand everything about them, right? That was sort of a joke. <laughs> There's a lot of things we don't understand. But here's what we know. He created the heavens and the earth. He's coming back for his people. Here's a way that is right and if we will be strong and courageous and walk in his way and not veer to the right or to the left, he will take care of every obstacle in our path and we can walk with boldness. Trust in the Lord. This happened also in the New Testament. Acts 4.36 says, Joseph, who is who's also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite, the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a certain man named Ananias, this is chapter 5, verse 1, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. He kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. 
Barnabas feels led to sell some land and, and to bring it and give it to the apostles for distribution. So he does it. Does what he felt like he needed to do. And Ananias and Sapphira, they witness this, the impact and the notoriety of this act and, and the sacrifice of Barnas, Barnabas. And they, they go to follow the example, but they try to deceive the community into thinking that they had, were bringing the full price of the property to the church. And here's what Peter's saying. Peter's saying that you didn't have to do this, first of all, unless God told you to do it. And, and you didn't have to bring it all unless God told you to do that. All this was up to you. These are choices that you made, the Lord. But the deception, because there was something hidden that everybody else couldn't see. Everybody else could see what they were doing, and everybody else might have assumed that they were doing everything they did, but there was a God in heaven that realized, no, this is a facade. It's not true. And Ananias died, and a short while later, Sapphira came in and also. And Peter said this, you're, you're not lying to me. I'm just a man who is serving in a role in an office that God has placed me in. So the authority is not of me. The authority is of God. You've lied to the Holy Ghost. 